Um, I want to welcome everyone to Colors of the French Quarter, a quarterly care workshop. This is session one, which is going to focus on the perspective of the homeowners. Um, I am Brooke Tesler. I'm the executive director of the VCC Foundation, and this is probably my favorite part of the job is doing these workshops. I was able to get for today's session, three amazing presenters, Michael Shoriak, who I have sat through some of his lectures at Tulane University, and they were some of my favorite. Joe Helm, who is second generation, and he's been working in New Orleans in paint for, I think, longer than he's Long been time. supposed to, longer than we're gonna tell the law. And then Renee Burgoyne, who is the deputy director of the VCC. Um, a little housekeeping. I know that those of us here in the greater New Orleans area might be worried about tornadoes and power outages. If you or I or anybody loses power, we're going to go with the show must go on mentality, record what we can. Um, some, not all of this will be reviewed in session two, which will be live streamed a week from tomorrow. Um, we are going to do questions after each section. So Michael's going to do a bit of history for us. Joe is going to talk about paint and Renee is going to talk about permitting. If you have questions throughout that you want to submit through chat, I'm happy to ask those questions for you at the appropriate times, or you can uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you. And lastly, because this is also part of my job, if you're not already a member, please consider making a donation or joining to become a member. It helps us keep supporting the VCC and protecting and preserving the French Quarter. And we are off to the races with Michael. Okay, great, thank you, Brooke. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Michael Shoriak, and I have been tasked with quickly, briefly going over kind of the history of color as it relates to the French Quarter. And basically how I'm going to do that, I'm gonna do that in three ways. Um, the first of which, will be to talk about the documents that are available to everybody um, and their own research of color, color of their house, color of the, the city as a whole, and how those colors have changed over time. <clears throat> so I'll show uh, one page that is uh, basically a tariff schedule talking about the different values of different color. And one of the main points I would like y'all to take away from my part of this section is that we have to separate our modern understanding of color from the historic understanding of color. And what I mean by that is now we have a totally skewed sense of what we can do with color because we have chemistry and modern technology that can create any color for us at any point in time. You can go into Helm Paint or Shoreham Williams and say, I want green, I want blue, I want red. The colors all cost the same. And that is not the way that it has always been. And basically the way that it's always been up until roughly World War I, going into World War II, where all these different paint technologies and chemistry really took off to give us color basically on demand. But in understanding historic colors, we have to understand that color is a physical thing. It comes from something out in nature or it's synthesized in a lab. But because of that, color can be scarce, meaning that I may wanna paint my house red, but I can't get the pigment to do that. Or I may wanna paint my house blue, but that's not really feasible. And so a main point that I'm going to try to make to you all tonight is the understanding that people thinking about color in the past is very different than our, our current understanding of that. Another way I'm going to try to show the transition and evolution of color to all of y'all is to show you some examples from a Tulane studio we did um, a couple years ago, really going to the archival sources and documentations that are available to us in the city of New Orleans. And the, the most notable of those are the notarial archives. And there, there is this amazing collection of building contracts, which gives you kind of narrative form. I want my house to be painted this way and you know, kind of going through and detailing out the construction of a building. But then the other documents that they have are these full scale, well, not full scale, but large scale watercolors and renderings of buildings in color from throughout past. So we're going before photography, certainly before color photography, so these documents are precious because uh, not every city has this. And by going through in a systematic way and looking at all of the representations of color and albeit there are issues with using any type of information and I'll kind of talk about that 
uh, when we get to that section. But this is a really precious resource that we have for us in New Orleans as a greater city, but also in the VCC, that we have an illustration of color through time. And we can look at that, we can chart that, we can document it, and we can use it to inform our, our understanding and our selections of color today. And then finally, I'm gonna use the example of the Beauregard Kai's house, um, which is something was also a part of that studio where we went through and did material sampling. Um, which basically means you're taking a sample from the surface of the building. That sample is then polished and cross-sectioned and you're looking at it under a microscope. And basically, and I'm gonna show these to you in, in, um, uh, coming up in a second here, but basically what it's showing you are all the different layers of paint, all the different colors that the building has been and all the transitions over time. This can show us, oh, well, maybe that's the original color because it's at the bottom, but there are issues associated to that. But really what it's telling us is this evolution of color. And I'm going to use the Beauregard Kai's house, but then I'm going to talk very briefly, briefly about the Brewer house at the end, because what you can find is that although these buildings were built by different people at different time periods, they become united in the stylistic evolution of color that is kind of evolves over time. Um, and part of the history of this, the city um, itself but then as the city becomes more open to people on a national level national styles and each style kind of has its own color um, vocabulary associated to it that seeps into the city of new orleans and it really takes off and kind of dominates um, color uh, in many ways within the city at that time and so in order to separate colors we first have to understand that colors have value and i'm going to share my screen here And so this chart right here, which just looks very boring and it's lines and dots and whatever, but it's actually the easiest way for me to express this concept of color and uh, differing values. So what we're looking at here is a chart from 1805, 1806 of British house paints and the pigments used therein that were um, uh, scheduled to tariffs within uh, Britain at that point in time. And so the bars moving from left to right are cheapest to most expensive. And as we move from top to, top to bottom, these are the different pigments that are being used, right? So whiting, calcium carbonate, one of the cheaper colors to make and create. It's down here on the far left-hand side. And all of the kind of the whites are over here. But if we get to the sections on blue, indigo is way over here on the other side, right? Indigo is being the first cash crop of this region, which, you know, there's kind of a history locally associated to it. But to say I want to paint my house white or to paint my house blue, it's not really a stylistic judgment on for the consumer to make because nobody could afford to paint their house in indigo, right? It just wasn't possible. And in using this, we can start to parse out different elements of the house and try to understand, well, if I'm going to paint the body of my house and I have a limited pot of money, what is the most likely color that the bottom of the body of my house is going to be, right? And we have this concept of white house with green shutters. Well, white house with green shutters could have been selected by people because they loved white houses with green shutters, but more often than not in history, color followed the material, right? And so the white became white because it was the most readily available and accessible to the people at that time. As we move down the list, there's these different greens which are synthesized. One, verdigris, which is a corrosion product, but verdure and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not trying to make everybody experts on pigments or anything right now, but I just want to show that we're, if we parse out colors, we can start to get some indication of where those colors may have or may have not been used on painting a building in 1805 or a building in 1825. And as you come down to the lower section of this chart, you see that another uh, segment of the of pigments that are cheap and most accessible to people are what are called the ochres. And ochres are basically, you look at the clay and the mud in Louisiana and it looks a certain color. And if you drive to Alabama, it's red. And if you drive somewhere else, it's a kind of yellowish color. Roughly, ochres are derived from clay bearing like um, uh, soils that have iron oxides in them that give them this different shades of color. 
what they also are are very cheap, right? And so when I'm going to be talking about the earliest kind of Creole days of color before national paint styles came in, a lot of these masonry buildings that are in and around the French Quarter were painted in ochres because they were accessible, they were readily available, but then also they satisfied a third requirement, which would be imitation. And we think today, and kind of we've gone through modernism as an architectural style, we look at buildings in a very different way now than people had looked at buildings in the past. But now we think of modernism as the purity of materials, the beauty of things as told by just looking at them, but that is not the way that it was in history. And so if you're walking through the quarter and you see all these buildings with lines on them, stucco buildings with lines on them, well, those lines were to try to fool you that, into thinking that that building was constructed out of stone. Some buildings have uh, stippled paint on them to make you think that the, the, uh, the stucco at the bottom of the building, and this is something that happens at the Borg Archives house, was constructed to using granite. Today, we think, oh, they're not gonna fool me. I don't think that about it, but that's really the vocabulary of the everyday person walking through the French Quarter in 1800, 1820. You're kind of, and people like Benjamin Latrobe and were writing about this at, the, at that point in time, but they described all the neat stucco houses lined off in order to imitate stone. And it gave New Orleans a kind of special beauty um, that other cities didn't have at that point in time. And so, the concept of color being a physical thing, color being a finite thing that has to be sourced locally, um, because we also have to imagine the city of New Orleans as being the farthest outpost you could pretty much be in, in the United States or in the world for that matter, at its colonial days and its founding in this time period. And because of that, materials had to be sourced locally. So we talk about soft red bricks, we talk about cypress as being the, the, the kind of wood species here, but you can also carry that further to the pigments that were available to people constructing these houses. And that availability of pigments in many ways informed um, how these buildings looked um, at that point in time. One last kind of illustration of this concept is the other part of the White House with green shutter story, right? That's the typical American house. And we think, well, maybe they picked green because green was the color that everybody liked. I don't know, it looks like trees. I, you know, I'm not really sure. But when you get down into it and you are start to understand the chemistry of the paints that they were using to paint these green shutters and all of these green colors and pigments come at a higher cost, right? So I can't paint my house green, but these millwork elements that are more valuable that I wanna preserve and I wanna protect, they've decided to paint those green. And if you understand a little bit about the toxicity and the chemistry of these early greens, they were toxic to everything. So they were toxic. If we were to eat them, it would be very bad for us, but also bugs, decay, fungi, all sorts of different things that are bad for our wooden elements in buildings were all affected by these. And so the idea, and I'm just trying to kind of play with our conceptions of what a house looks like at these point in times, but the White House and green shutters wasn't white and green because people liked white and green. It was white and green because color is a material and it's got a history to it. And there are reasons and availability and value associated to all these different things that are informing the way that the houses are looking through our history. Right? And so I'm leading off kind of <clears throat> with that. Uh, second to this, and if we're just talking about color only, well, actually we can't only talk about color because if we're only talking about pigment, we don't actually get that color onto the wall surface, right? If you just take pigment, you throw onto the wall, it's not gonna stick. So that color has to be in something. It's gotta be in a medium, right? Again, modern, historic, very, very different, right? And basically paint technology was roughly the same up until about 1900. And at that point in time, there's an explosion of all these different varieties of paints in order to paint the new things that were being created by the industrial revolution, planes, cars, Try, you know, all these different things required new types of paints in order to protect them. And because of that, and because of new access to synthetic dyes and pigments and stuff like that, there was this explosion of availability of, of colors. But before that, and if we're talking specifically about the French Quarter, there were only a couple of different mediums in which to use. And I'm making the case that the appropriate color to paint any building is the color that's in the medium that's appropriate to the, to the material that you're actually painting. 
And what that means is if I'm painting a masonry building and though that masonry in it is porous and permeable and water can be drawn into it through capillary action and water needs to be released from it, that finish that's on top of that masonry has to have the proper properties of permeabilities and, por and porosity, right? We've all heard, oh, don't put Portland cement on your building, or no, don't put elastomeric paints on your building. Really, that's heading into, into the direction of what I'm talking about right now. Portland cement doesn't have any permeability and porosity. It's not the devil. It's actually a really amazing material, but it's just not appropriate to use on something that has such dramatically different properties. And the same case is made with paints. If you're putting something that has no porosity and permeability on a masonry material that's porous and water continuously is drawn up to it, it's going to create problems for you. And the paints that were available and that were being used um, in kind of history, and right now I'm really uh, talking specifically about 1780 up until about 1900 within the city, but these were waterborne paints. So lime washes, lime washes that are glue bound as well, right? So glue bound meaning hide glue. Um, Elmer's glue is a, a very similar product as that. And these materials or these mediums that the pigment was put into gave this full wall section the porosity and permeability um, that's necessary, right? So we can talk about appropriateness of colors, but really we have to at the same time be talking about the appropriateness of the paint itself. And there's a distinction between those two I'm trying to illustrate that distinction about separating pigment and me medium in history, but really the same thing can be done um, today. So, sorry, I'm just gonna go full screen here. So again, uh, this information is coming from a Tulane studio we did in 2019, where we took a specific building and we try to place it within its context, within the city, within the national context. Then we went, and that's this panel over here uh, on your left, I believe, uh, but over here, if you can see my cursor. Uh, the second panel right here is we went into the notarial archives. We looked at every color representation, watercolor painting from 1800 to 1830. We developed these chromatic series in order to understand the relationships between them. And I'll talk about all of that kind of stuff when we get there. And then finally, I'm going to show you all a couple of cross sections of the sampling that we did at the Borgar Kai house, Kai's house in order to physically sample the thing, right? So we're giving contextual information at first. This is what's going on at the time. And then we try to bear down at a, a, an individual building. And I'll kind of uh, quickly go through that um, and how that process works uh, with this. So Borgard Kai's house, for those of you, very briefly, 1925 or eight or something like that. Um, but basically it's constructed at a time when the buildings that were built before it looked very different and the buildings that were built after it looked very different. And it's in this transition period. And we can talk about transition of materials themselves. Well, it's got this pediment, maybe it's Greek revival. It's got this type of window, maybe it's federal, but I'm making the case and the argument that color is also an inter, uh, intimately linked part of style in and of itself. And if you can understand stylistic colors, you can start to be able to read these uh, paint samples that I'm gonna show to you and be able to understand how that evolution affected the city over time. But basically built at a time when the city is dramatically changing, there's all this construction happening, but also what's going on right now is that there used to be, or there was a core of the kind of Francophone Spanish people living in the quarter and in the, the early suburbs around them. But at this point in time, all sorts of people are starting to come in from the Northeast, right? And we get the modern CBD, which the, the buildings look very different. The people look very, um, are from a very different background and that causes them to decorate their spaces um, in a different way. And you can even still see that um, to this day. But this house is sitting kind of right in between those time periods. And so here, we just took all the information, we boiled it down and distilled it into just kind of a, a chromatic bar, right? All of this and every single thing I say about color, you have to take with a grain of salt, right? Color is a material thing, but my impression of green might not be your impression of green and blue. And it's actually an incredibly fascinating topic and it's, but it's not for us to get into tonight. So when I say green or blue or whatever, just that's what I'm seeing right now, you may see something subtly different, right? But if you start to put them all together and you're looking at, well, 
what were the facades of these buildings painted at that point in time? And we have this, these are kind of what I would call the ochres, these orangey, red, earthy tones, things that are easily um, used in order to imitate stone. The trim work, which maybe comes in a different medium, which means when the pigments themselves, maybe you can spend a little bit more money on them because you're not painting as much surface area, tend to be these white colors. The shutters, we already talked about green and the kind of um, uh, prevalence of green as being used in these in these elements. And if you just lump them all together, you can see relationships um, between them just visually. But then if you start to break them out through time and you're looking at the actual um, the perspectives of them. And so basically before you had photography, if you wanted to sell your building, you would have an architect come out and draw it. And the beautiful part about these is that they were drawn as they were. They weren't fancified. They weren't stylized. This was supposed to be the real representation of this building, cracks, warts, and all. And because of that, we can try to, we can lean on these, I think, a little bit more than a kind of standard representation of a building in the built environment. But again, we are looking at a lift, we are looking at a watercolor and representing that color, and that color is now being represented to you. It's a, a whole thing. But if we just stay at the surface of it, we can see these earlier buildings, um, and these are dating. Uh, from basically 1800 to 1830s. That at that time period is kind of the, the Creole time period and Creole being defined as, in terms of color, as coming from here, as being, we weren't connected to the vast web yet. And the materials that were being utilized were either coming from in and around this environment or the environments that are directly related uh, to New Orleans through the Spanish colonial time, right? So Havana, uh, St. Augustine, um, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Those cities look very similar to New Orleans and they also have very similar colorations of them. But then through time, we can watch that color change and evolve to something else. So we go from this Creole time period until the next kind of main stylistic convention of the United States, which is the Greek Revival. And if the Greek Revival has a color associated to it, that color is white, right? And so we just get this prevalence where we were in these ochres and kind of reddish hues, then we go to White House with green shutters, White House with green shutters, right? And we can just see this play out over time. Other interesting details, and it's a little bit difficult to read here, but this little house, which is a cottage on St. Philip Street between Claiborne and North Robertson, this is a wooden house, but the wooden house has been painted in a way to make you think that it's made out of granite, right? So if we're looking at this today, it's like, why would you ever do that? You're not gonna fool me into thinking that your house was granite, but almost, I will not want to say almost every house, but a lot of houses in and around the French Quarter with either scored stucco in, or, in order to imitate Ashlon's, Ashlar stone coursing or wooden blocks that are being assembled onto the facade in order to make you think that this building is actually something that it's not. The uh, Library of Congress has records associated to this. Habs have records associated to this. And we're talking specifically about the Borg Archives House when they did these drawings in halves in 1934, they even talk about the color. <clears throat> There's evidence of three colors of the, of the stucco, first a deep pink or red, then an ochre, now a gray, right? And so that is a moment in time of an architect who is out of work and being employed by the United States government to go at these buildings and draw them at scale in order to preserve them. So you wanna give these some weight, right? I think that these, this guy saw um, what he was trying to represent. The last line of this, the stucco is lined off in order to represent stone joints. I won't get into all of this stuff here, but you can use these Habs drawings to date different elements of this building. We know that this was instructed in 1880. We know that the back porch was added at this point in time, so on and so forth. And because of that, we can then be able to date moments in time through the stratigraphies that we're using. And so before we get into this, and please, there's a misspelling at the bottom right um, there. I apologize, but it's been there for quite a while and I, for some reason, never change it. But if you're looking at this picture right here, you're actually looking at all of the different colors that this building was painted. And when we started this, um, we, we were not very optimistic about finding this type of information because if you can imagine a building in the city of New Orleans or really anywhere in the environment, having a material stay on the surface of that building that's been exposed to hurricanes and floods and all sorts of different things, it's highly, highly, highly unlikely 
that there is original fabric left in buildings that are exposed to the weather. But if I jump back a slide real quick, what the Beauregard Kai's house is this porch, which through the studio were determined was actually not original to the building, was added on very soon after its construction. But another thing that this porch does is protect this stucco right here. And when I'm showing you this picture, we're looking at the surface of the stucco that is protected by the porch that was put onto that building somewhat sometime before 1840. And if we start down here on the right hand side and we move up to the top left, we're looking at all of these different colors. And it was kind of a shock to everybody when the studio came back and said the Beauregard Kai's house was originally this brown color. And the initial thing was tell us what color to paint the building, but I don't know. It's not in the taste sentiment of today, right? If we move across it, and I'm going to show this, show this to you in more detail, so you may see it now, but that's okay. But if you're looking here, you can see this grayish color and kind of black stippling going on right here. And that is the first time that this building was repainted, and it was painted in imitation of granite. The steps themselves are made out of granite, and they were trying to unify the whole base of the building to look the same. And so this is really what we're calling the first phase of it. Then we go through an entire period of whites. So, and it's, it's hard to see that here, but you can see them in the cross sections. That's the Greek revival. Then we have a whole segment of time that are these browns, reds, off white. They're actually sim um, similar to these earlier ochres and you know, in the kind of Creole period, but now we're operating in the idiom of the Victorian style. And at that point in time, those colors are being inputted and put on buildings of all different types and styles all across the country. But we can see um, uh, see that evolution and trans um, and how it transformed from these earlier times up until that point. And then finally, at the top of it, we start to get to in some of these what I call uh, initial preservation stylistic things. When people in the 1920s and 30s started to become interested in the quarter as this beautiful thing decaying and as something to be preserved, they started to go back through and try to understand what it was before. And so you see this kind of rebirth of granitizing a column in order to make you think that it's stone when it's not. You see this um, rebirth of the use of greens, um, which I'll show you um, again. And so one where we're looking at it at the surface, and this is me just looking at the, the, the surface of the building, but right here, what I'm actually doing is taking a sample from here, a small sample, cutting it in half, and right now we're looking at it in section, right? So imagine if I had an apple in my hand and I cut that apple in half, and now I'm looking at all the different paint layers that have been applied to the skin of that apple, right? And so down here, we have the stucco itself. And this brownish color right here is that same brown color that's being represented right here. When I talked about the whites and the granitizing, the granitizing layer is really small here. It's difficult to see, but the whites are here. We move into the Victorian period at this point in time, so on and so forth. And that's how we're trying to pull in and date these elements. But really the point I'm trying to make here is that each of these buildings started off as their own thing, but then ultimately they were kind of unified by nationalistic styles that informed the way that buildings were painted, not only in the New or not only in New Orleans, but also across the country as well. You can do this for stuccos, but you can also do this for the wooden elements. So a question that was presented to the class at this point in time was, what was the original finish of this door um, in the front? And you take the sample here. Well, this door was painted white a lot of times for the very earliest time period in its history, but then it was grained sometime during the Victorian period. And you can see that by overlapping use of different colors in order to Im imitate uh, the different patterns uh, and textures of wood. But this shows up here, and then you kind of initiate this whole other thing after that. And so this is one small example and maybe more confusing than actually helpful, but it's really trying to illustrate the third tool that we have within kind of the toolbox and understanding the evolution of color and how we can understand how it's changed over time. Um, yes. And then finally, um, uh, very quickly, I just want to show one more example to show the connection and the relationship between all of these different buildings. Um, and I'm just hopping straight to this one slide here. But this is the Signore Brulder House at 520 Royal Street, constructed in 1816. 
uh, and we did a finishes analysis uh, of it before um, the historic New Orleans collection uh, created the new museum and everything there. And here um, we actually are taking a, a sample uh, from one of these fan light windows in the back, right? We look at these old buildings, we think it's full of all this historic fabric, but once you start to parse it all out, really in terms of the material fabric, there's not much left other than the structure of it. And of the wooden elements that are there, a lot of them have been changed out. But here we were lucky that these fan lights date all the way back. Um, and we, we were able to determine that based on the relationship to other uh, elements that are in the building. But I just want to direct your attention, albeit dark right here, to this sample here to show the relation between, relationship between this building and the Borg Archives house. This was built in 1816, uh, Borg Archives 1820s. Uh, we down here, this is a, a series of greens. Again, I apologize about the contrast. We go through a whole period of whites, right? Again, the Greek Revival, all buildings are being painted bright white at that point in time. We get into these darker colors, browns, reds, we're getting into the Victorian time. And these greens is kind of, and again, we're talking about a wooden element here as opposed to a stucco element that we were talking about at Borg Archives, where we initiate this kind of uh, rediscovery and uh, reuse of the historic greens. In this building, we were, we were lucky at the Borg Archives house that had this sheltered area where we could see this color underneath other ones but here, there was an addition put onto the back of this building in 1822 that buried this original stucco sample in the building throughout that whole time. Um, so not only do we have it so that we can see it in cross section, we can see this pigment in stucco that was derived through those ochres that we talked about at the very beginning of this presentation um, and was used also lined off in imitation of stone. But here it still exists and there's still a surface finish associated to it which is exceedingly rare. And so um, all that is to just wrap up the way that we're accessing information about color. Right? We can use local sources like um, James P. Tott included the 19 or 1790s tariff schedule uh, and his autobiography or, or something like that. There we can see the different pigments that are being imported. We can look at the cost of different uh, individual colors because colors are things. Uh, uh, and they had different values in the past. We can go to the archives and look at the uh, amazing visual representation of color that exists or existed throughout the city of New Orleans and its ev evolution. And then finally, we can use uh, material analysis to look specifically at one building and even more specifically at individual elements on the building in order to place that building or that element within the context of the building itself or the city of New Orleans, but then ultimately within the national context um, of color. So with that, um, I hope um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Does anybody have questions? Let me... I have a question. Yes, please. Um, is there a way to get a copy of the PDF that he was discussing? Good question. Uh, yes, I can give it um, give it to Brooke or uh, whatever is the easiest way um, to do that. I do have this problem right now where I was economizing and got rid of my Adobe programs. So I can't actually take it and snip it right now, but I can make it available to anybody who would want it, just not right there, right now at this second. I, I would actually like to do something, Brooke, maybe we can discuss this afterwards. Um, the color chart that you had, Michael, that would be something really great for us to put on our website. Yeah. Um, to, to be able to, for people to access. They're asking about this stuff all the time. I think that would be a great idea. Uh, sure, happy to give it. Uh, just give a shout out to the Tulane students um, who did it whenever y'all use it. And I'm sure they'd be happy for y'all to, to do anything you want with it. Uh, yeah. We're I'm all happy to... alumnus, so yes. <laughs> we will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to share both of those and make sure that I, I note credit um, appropriately on all of it. Um, was I'm sorry, I have a question. Was 
was BK House lavender or was that a gray? Uh, so it was originally, uh, it was actually originally a federal style building mm -hmm. and the front porch was kind of put onto it, which was something that was a discovery and shocking to it, but it was corroborated by the brick types and mortars and joinery and all sorts of different information until we had to allow ourselves to believe that it actually wasn't original to that building. But it was originally this very kind of dark brown. And then from that, if you walk by the building today, the next phase of that is that it was turned into a Greek revival building by adding a pediment onto it, putting this granitized scored stucco base and painting the top white. And really you have to think about buildings like Gallier Hall in New Orleans, there are all sorts of ones that have this same vocabulary to them, not just here, but then also all across the United States as well. Um, but then from there in the 1880s and 90s, it was some pretty crazy and wacky colors. Um, and there are places in the building where you can still see this. Um, and so just more to what our eyes see and what we think looks good, as opposed to what people back then, we really have to sever our connection to it because we we're looking at two totally different things. Yeah, because I mean the Victorians kind of had I, I like to think of it as had fun with color, and so I didn't know what what color I was seeing during that era in the in the section view. I thought that was interesting. And I know I'm not supposed to be asking questions, but I have it. It looked like the uh, Victorian area that, that those were very dark colors, though. I mean, correct? I mean, they were. And I understand like the browns and whatnot. So that's uh, it, I, that, it, totally fascinating what you presented there. It's incredible. And again, just remember that color, me representing color is fraught with all sorts of challenges. Um, so what it looks like to y'all, I don't even know what it looks like but through your eyes, but then also on your screen and stuff like that. So, but basically if we can just summarize them, that's about as far as we need to go in terms of understanding the interrelationship between the national, the local, and the, the, all the different contexts of play. No offense, Joe, but I don't want this part to end. Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> no, I, I could have. I could. I may change your mind when I'm done. <laughs> you you will. I know you will. I know I. I, I won't change your mind though. So good thing I'm last. <laughs> <laughs> um, if nobody else has questions for Michael, then we will have Joe talk about like Michael talked about how you know paint was what was available. It was from the dirt, if you will. Um, Joe is going to talk about what you have now and why it may be good or bad. Well, first of all, I'm just fascinating that, you know, what Michael talked about and how it relates to some of the things I'm gonna talk about is the, the permeability of some of these uh, coatings and, and what's practical use uh, of, of paint coatings on these different substrates. And I thought I'd break it down by talking about the substrates, because I think that's what the, where the, a lot of the questions come. And when I'm, uh, I deal with customers every day asking the same type of questions. And most of it has to do with what's appropriate for what substrate and what's gonna last or give the, the, the longevity that we all want um, in terms of, uh, of of using a coating or you know what happens to that coating over time. Um, but I would first like to talk about oil versus latex um, and where kind of oils are coming from, why they're good, why they're, they're not so good and where can we use these types of uh, coatings. The oils um, it, it, for a long period of time um, until latex became very popular in the 1950s and 60s were the way to go. Obviously there was uh, lead contained in these products and they had longevity and I think some of those um, those thoughts and some of those beliefs still exist that people will say well I want to use oil on this because you know such and such. So. Um, kind of what I think about oils and what I've seen my experience out in the field and some of the things that we talk to to uh, engineers every day about is, you know, what's best for what. And oils will cure harder. Uh, they will become a harder coating than, than acrylic or latexes. So on areas that, that do take a lot of abuse, they, they've been kind of that, that mark for a long time. But uh, there are some things that we can talk about. For instance, um, you know, oils do bond better to other oils. They're going to bond better to latexes. And I always get the question, latex over oil, oil over latex. Well, 
it's really about a mechanical bond uh, as opposed to a chemical bond. So, you know, if you can't, if you, you can't put some, something on top of a really hard surface um, and expect it to bond unless you actually would sand that surface or use a primer or whatever. That's where oils um, will come in because oils pretty much stick to anything. So, so they have better bonds uh, usually to other coatings. But exterior, on an exterior application, oils tend to uh, oxidize a lot faster than the, the, the waterborne. We're going to use the waterborne term uh, for latexes. Uh, they tend to uh, oxidize at a much faster rate. They cure at a faster rate, so they get harder and they crack over time. So longevity can be an issue with some of the oil products. Uh, colors uh, tend to fade faster. Sheen levels tend to fade faster. And it has propensity after that that sheen level has uh, dissipated to become prone to mildew or uh, mold on it or attaching to it. The permeability of these products are extremely low. Um, they do not allow great vapor transfer, uh, which can be an advantage on some of the wood surfaces that you have, some of the hard surfaces that will take a beating. Uh, we like it on porches. You know, that's, that's kind of the place that I would say is the best place for us to use oils. In other areas, they can be a hindrance. Um, but they are, they are preferred as a primer to wood because they do penetrate uh, a wood surface and they become, they have a better bond and you can top coat with the latex so that it weathers actually better on, on a wood door or whatnot. Uh, the latexes um, have excellent adhesion. They've, they've improved themselves. Uh, Benjamin Moore is what we sell, but um, that product has improved uh, vastly over the last two decades. And um, in most cases, all of our products are zero, zero VOC, and we have different coloring systems to work with that, that allow better hiding, better performance outside, better performance in the case of UV. Um, and they're actually much better at gloss retention. So there's a lot of advantage to using waterborne products, uh, including the fact that they are more permeable than their oil-based counterparts. Um, you know, you might have, if we were gonna do a, uh, a permeability scale, from zero being uh, the least uh, permeable or the least uh, that a, a vapor or water would permeate through that surface, zero would be the number, 100 being the most uh, permeable. The latex is probably range in the high 20s uh, where an oil might be in the, the one or two in some cases. So that's that's what we when we talk about permeability. Um, the waterborns, as I said before, have better gl gloss and color retention. They have a high resistance to chalking. Um, they have a high resistance to mold and mildew because they do not contain a food source such as linseed oils that are used uh, quite um, uh, commonly in oil-based products uh, for mold or mildew. So that's why we like those products. And they have a, a high resistance to cracking, peeling, and dirt pickup because they don't get as hard and uh, they won't crack nearly as much or become compromised at any point on that. Let's see, let's go back. So moving forward and talking about substrates, um, let's see. This is a wood substrate we're referring to. And as I said before, uh, on wood substrates, we'd wanna use a, a slower drying primer, something that's gonna be a two to four hour dry. There are many primers out there that would dry in 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you have no penetration in that wood. So they don't, uh, they don't, they don't penetrate. You don't have quite the bond. Um, you always want to prime before you patch or caulk. A lot of times people will put oil-based uh, coatings or primers on top of a patch or caulk. That inhibits uh, the flexibility of that patch or caulk. So you have to be, be sure that you don't do that. You want to prime out your wood. You want to caulk and patch at that point, And then you want to, to top coat on top of that. Typically, you'll put a prime coat or a, a, a light coat of the top coat, if it's a latex primer um, or a latex top coat, on top of that patched area so you seal it and you hold out so you can get the proper sheen levels. Um, if you're going to use oil-based primers, we want to only prime what we're going to be able to top coat in a week because of what we talked about before. It's prone to holding dirt. It's prone to mildew, and that's why we want to avoid that. Um, and as I said, I like oil top coats on wood porches. I think it does a good job and uh, it's easy It's easy to go on top of that. You can put latex top coats on top of oil-based primers. They're designed for that. So that is a good, uh, a really good system, a good combination. Um, on final coats on wood, 
we're talking about using uh, acrylic latexes because of their performance. Uh, sealing uh, poor tree paints, very easy with latex. Shutters and doors will hold up better, hold its gloss better, hold its uh, color better, and, and it will be resistant to mold. So that's, that's why we want to do those things. Um, satin or soft gloss would be preferred on trim, where uh, some of the other um, uh, areas you probably want to go with a lower sheen. Ceilings are typically low sheens. Um, on porches, we usually go with a higher gloss on that. Let's see if I can move this along here. This would be metals uh, that we're talking about. Um, there are two types of metals. Uh, metals are uh, ferrous metals, or they are, uh, and I missed a major, I go back to that, um, or non ferrous metals. Ferrous metals contain iron. They always want to go back to have that natural state, uh, which is iron. It wants to sacrifice itself to oxygen and moisture, so it becomes rusty. So when you have uh, these porch railings or hinges on these uh, shutters, you really want to use something that's going to hold uh, hold out the the, uh, the 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 permeability. So this in this case on a ferrous metal, we'd want to use oil base uh, primers or oil base uh, direct to metals, so that we can slow down oxidation and we can slow down the rusting mechanism that happens to all metal. Typically, what happens is you have a buildup where a weld was on maybe the the iron uh, railing, and you want to knock those those little um, appendages off the surface so that they don't rise above the coating. If those appendages above the coating, it actually can track itself underneath the coating, and then you have a, a rust or a failing type piece of metal. So we like oil-based uh, primers or direct to metals on, on these types of uh, metals, which are ferrous metals. Non-ferrous metals do not contain iron. It would be like aluminum, zinc, copper, and they have a, a, a tendency to react with oil-based products on top of it, which is called saponification, whereas a soap cr is created underneath the coating, it's a powder type material, so then you, you lose adhesion with that particular product. So on non-ferrous metals, we'd wanna go with uh, latex products uh, or acrylic products, whether it be an acrylic primer or direct to metals uh, in, a, in an acrylic, in a waterborne. Um, we can also use our, our uh, house paint top coats like our Regal or our Ben, to actually go onto these surfaces without a primer, so it makes it easy for the individual to uh, to coat that. I'm gonna go back to masonry because I think I've passed that up. Um, so on masonry, um, we we like acrylics on top of that, but the most really the most permeable product are called mineral paints, uh, which we do sell mineral paints as well. Two of the manufacturers we sell is called Kime or Roma Bio. We um, Mostly what we sell to most residences are the Benjamin Moore, Regal, and Ben, which are acrylic products. So if we're talking about mineral paint and why we like mineral paint, it's because the permeability is so high. The permeability on a mineral paint could be in the upper 70s, depending on the manufacturer and the color. So that creates a, if you have water wicking, like it's, it's so much, uh, you see that so often in a quarter, you have a way for that water to escape and to, and to, uh, to get out of the surface or from behind. If you see failing paint on a surface, typically uh, that means that water has found its way out and it's popping off the paint. So you have to go to other means, typically to waterborne products that will perform better. So waterborne are easy to apply. You do get about 400 square feet per gallon. It is an improved permeability of oil or alkyls, which you don't recommend. Uh, improved color and sheen retention, as we talked about all along. You can get, if, you, if we have cold days during the summer in January, we're able to put this product on without a problem. There are masonry sealers to lock down chalk. If chalking has occurred or the, the, uh, the surface has uh, effloresced in some way, shape or form, we can go back and use a masonry sealer to lock that down. And we do not recommend elastomerics on most of these, or, or all of the, uh, the products that are wicking water because you trap the water in that substrate. So we wanna avoid that. Um, the mineral paints are highly, they're extremely high in permeability, as I stated before. You can go directly to the substrate unless it's really, really bad chalking. It's improved color retention. We had a, a situation where we, um, we were shown this, but uh, a, a lighthouse in Florida that got hit with a hurricane, the, the wind and uh, the debris actually um, took the paint off of one of the sides of it. 
And the, originally, this lighthouse was coded in 1903. This hurricane happened in 1905. They went back and touched up the lighthouse 100 years later, and it touched up. So pretty incredible in terms of uh, uh, color uh, retention. I, I've never seen anything like that. Uh, but it is a more expensive product. It's only available in flat finishes, um, and it's probably double to triple of a regular house paint. It's also got a high resistance to, and it's actually made with silica. Most of, most of your uh, mineral paints are made with potassium silica. That's the the, uh, the mineral, or you think of it as sort of a rock type that they build this, they build the pigments with those particular rocks as like Michael, that would be something we could go into. <laughs> but And then they build the product and then they ship the product to you uh, made and ready to go. And we have we have used it on a few of the uh, the homes in the French Quarter, which has been really successful for us. So. One of the things that with Benjamin Moore is what we're doing is and what we're going to show next week is the is the color palette that has gone and and uh, Miss Magno, Ms. Magno, who's going to be presenting next week in our big April 7th uh, presentation, has done research with this, looked at the architectures and put the colors together. And we're using Benjamin Moore color. And I think you'll find that very interesting um, if you're able to make that. And that's basically where I wanted to talk about. I know it's not a whole lot of information, but I am open to questions. So please, by all means, if you have a question, let me know. I have a question. Yes. Brooke, um, I think you're I, muted. I, oh, Brooke, okay. You're muted. No, no, Brooke was muted. <laughs> you're good, sorry. Okay. I'm okay? You are, thank you. Okay, so my question is, I have a house that has metal siding, the old aluminum type siding, and I'm perplexed about if we're going to have to eventually touch it up with paint, that it does seem chalky. It's like, what kind of paint would they have used like in the 1950s and what type would you use to recoat some type of metal like that? In a man it, it and I don't know this for a fact, but probably in a manufacturing setting like that, it was some solvent born type product that was a fast dry for production purposes. And it could be that way if it's that old. Now, typically after you, pre we do a lot of this, but after you press wash, you can actually use our acrylic directly to it. So you don't have to really do anything special. This will bond to it as long as that surface is sound. If the surface isn't sound, if you have loose, you know, a loose coating on that surface and you're, you're exposed to bare metal, um, you probably just want to make sure you get all the loose stuff off, make sure it's clean, and then go back. You can go to, directly to it with our house paint. Our Regal or our Ben product will bond very well to that. And we've had very, very good success with it. And it's probably faded quite a bit, um, but we can match. If you have an area that's shaded or protected or held its color, we can match that directly. That's very easy. Okay. All right, that's great to know. Thank you. Yeah, not difficult. Anybody else have any questions? It was a great question. Wonderful question. You see how interesting this is? No, I love it. Brandy? I have a question. Yes. Um, so in a lot of these structures, um, some uses that wouldn't have been approved. So for instance, I have an 1830 house and there probably wasn't a shower in there um, until a hundred years later. So in these spaces where we're having to put in uh, elements like showers, where there may be something like a window or something like that, do you recommend the use of things like an, an advanced product, the alkyd based paint on the inside where a wood window would be getting wet? Or what would you recommend to do kind of different duty than it was probably originally intended? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we need to seal that surface. We need to caulk that surface, probably using uh, a product, maybe a, maybe a paintable silicone, perhaps, but something that's not going to shrink. So if we stop the water from getting in the gaps of, the, say, a sill or around a window, um, that's a big part of it. Secondly, I would probably use, I probably would use an oil or a, a waterborne alkyd like you're referring to the advanced product because it's going to hold up. 
The issue we have with that is if it, you can't submerge these types of coatings. I mean, if it's constantly wet, we probably want to go to something more of an epoxy. We have waterborne epoxies that once that water actually uh, is, you know, emits itself from that, that, that product, it's an epoxy resin that'll hold up to that type of thing. And in some cases could be used for immersion. I'm not really pushing that unless it's really wet, wet, wet. And, and that would be a case by case basis. But you do have to seal all the wood. The wood has to be completely sealed. It has to be caulked extremely well so that you don't get moisture behind the sub, you know, in that substrate. Once that substrate becomes, um, once water gets behind, it's kind of, it's going to swell, it's going to crack, it's going to become compromised, and we need to avoid doing that. I would say, you know, we could go, as long as it's sealed, we, all, we have a, a, a good um, a surface to go to. I would probably use the advance to start with. In wet areas, typically the oil bases are going to, they're going to work better, but it's a catch-22. If it constantly stays wet, it probably will mold. So I like the waterborne alkids because it's the best of both worlds. If it's just getting wet, it's not a big deal. If water is standing on the sill, that's a problem. So we need to go to something a little more heavier duty in terms of coatings. And we can help you in here with that We in, in the stores. Um, or we can send somebody out there to look at it too. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think Ms. Bruno has a question. Hi, I'm wondering, can you paint vinyl siding? Is it possible sure. to paint vinyl siding? You sure you can. All right, typically, Here's the, uh, some of the caveats with vinyl siding, because if you're painting a uh, dark on your siding, let's say it's an off-white, if you want to paint it with a dark green, typically those sidings aren't uh, manufactured to take a heat rating that is going to exist with a darker color that's taken on the sun, that's taken on UV. It'll heat up and it'll warp. So if you go into a lighter color, no problem. You can paint our house paint, a regal or a bend directly to these substrates um, with as long as they're clean. It's gonna work, it's gonna bond fine, and it's gonna work well. It's gonna be flexed, it's gonna flex itself with the product itself. If you're going to, if you're gonna put a darker color on top of a, uh, I mean, excuse me, yeah, if you're gonna put a darker color on top of a lighter siding, that could be a, that could be a problem. So we wanna probably stay around the same color range or lighter, and we won't have a problem. We have the products go directly to it. Oh, what about all those vinyl windows that people have put in and glommed onto the outside of their houses? Is there any way to paint them? They look better. You can paint them. I don't. What we don't want to create is a big maintenance issue on these vinyl windows. But if you have to change the color, we have bonding primers and we have we have things that'll bond. We have something that'll work to bond to it and be very durable and last a long period of time. Um, it's just that. If, if you don't like the color, yes, we can change it, but most people will go with the vinyl because it holds up for a longer period of time than the, than the product itself. Depends on the color. If you don't like the color, then we can paint it. Is that it, Ms. Bruno? Ms. Bruno's got all kinds of questions. Look no, at I like it though, it's good. I love having people from other historic districts at our stuff as well. Because you don't find that vinyl in the French Quarter, but you definitely do find it in the neighboring area. You better not. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be in big trouble. <laughs> You'll be in big trouble in the French Quarter. You can't even have Hardy Board. Um, did I hear you correct that the best, we have so, so, so much brick in the French Quarter that the best paint for that is a mineral paint because it has, like Michael was saying, the, uh, I'm not going to say the words right, but it's porous and Breathes, well, I right, and it, what it, you have a lot of wicking water, so you have you see failing products. People have tried everything. When you try to put on a crumbling substrate that's wicking water, and you're trying to put something to it, it's never. Sometimes it never dries. So sometimes you get to find you got to find the right products to go. If something doesn't dry, it's very hard to paint. You know? Yes. So people try. Well, people try a lot of different things. They'll put waterproofing products and things that they think will stop that. When you can't do that, you actually have to get it at the feet below slab or you know at the at the slab, and and typically those products um, they will fail, and you'll see a lot of failures going up the walls and whatnot. So the, the mineral paints have the highest permeability, but that doesn't mean it's going to work on a wet mm -hmm. surface or anything like that. So 
we have to be careful how we how we go about that. And we have used other products uh, to do that. We have, you know, we have vapor barriers that you can use that will that will uh, halt uh, moisture pushing through, but it's going to find its way somewhere. It's going to find its way somewhere. So coatings can coatings are good and coatings can work. And and when you have a, an exterior bare, you know, stucco, or you have an area that's failed, you can go back with something that's more permeable than some of the other products that have been used, such as a mineral paint or uh, an acrylic that's permeable. And then I did have somebody from a different historic district submit a question about painting CMU blocks. So typically CMU is mostly a all acrylic system and we would use probably a block fill. They call it a block filler, which is a, uh, a, a high mill or a high build type acrylic product that builds itself and impregnates the, the CMU so that it's sealed and becomes a smoother uh, a substrate and it will accept paint and it doesn't just absorb into a very porous block. So we like to use, um, if it hadn't been painted before, we'd like to use a block filler. Those are, those are relatively inexpensive uh, primers or fillers, if you will. Then we come back with two coats of acrylic and it's, it's a very good system that lasts for a long period of time. Thank you. Ms. Bruno, did you have another question? She's raising a hand. Damn, what do you do in your house if you have rising dab around your chimneys, but you don't want your paint to peel off the walls? You know what I mean by rising damp? When you say rising damp, you mean moisture's coming through the, and, and, and then- Around the chimney, yeah. Yeah. So we have clear coatings. Uh, we have what they call Block stains, stylings, designed to not change the appearance of the brick. They they don't look any different, and they don't allow. They're they're very hydrophobic. They don't allow moisture to to penetrate. But you can't tell that you have a coating on the surface. Is that what you're asking? The walls around my chimney. When I've got a brick chimney, the walls around it have peeling paint on it because of rising damp. Apparently. Rising damp, it's rising damp coming up. from the from the top, from the bottom. It's rising the bottom. from the ground. I got you. Okay, I understand. So, in that particular situation, there's not a whole lot you can do besides try to to to, uh, to coat the walls. Like we can try some, we can try different things from in, you know from the inside. Or get, I don't know how you get to those surfaces to stop the moisture from rising up that surface behind a wall. You'd have to actually get to that that substrate and I don't know how you're gonna do that. You wanna if you wanna break out the walls around <laughs> I think that's not gonna happen. But that's what you'd have to do. Or we treat the walls like we were referring to before. We use products that allow vapor transfer on those walls so that you don't have that that issue. Oh great. Let's see, do we have any other questions before we move on to permitting the fun, fun topic of the government? <laughs> I think coatings beat that. Yes, I, I, Renee knew why she was at the end. Exciting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. And I can't. I can't wait to hear about permitting, Renee. You want me to run the slideshow or do you yeah, want to um, do it? Yes, can you do it? Of course. If you don't mind, thank you. I don't mind. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm Renee Bergwin. I'm Deputy Director of the Lucre Commission. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about is the regulatory process for a painting permit. Uh, just so I know we have a lot of different historic districts on the line tonight, just so you know, you only need a paint permit in the French Quarter. So what I'm talking about is very specific, um, unlike the different types of paint um, that Joey was just talking about, just so that gives you a little idea. Um, again, we are the mm -hmm. only historic district that requires a permit for painting. Um, the French Quarter, uh-oh, is it working? Sorry, sorry. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay. I'm gonna give a little lead in, so no big deal. Okay, uh, the I've French the Quarter, <laughs> since the French Quarter is the oldest neighborhood, um, arguably the oldest neighborhood in the city, it's a living neighborhood and we want people to have choices. 
we don't want them to feel that they're just really hemmed in by these colors. Um, we do want for people to know, Brooke, let me see if I can share. Hold on. I got it. I got it. I just opened the wrong one. I'm sorry. I opened up the first version. Perfect. <laughs> um, we want people to know that, you know, they do have some choices and they are not just stuck with one palette. Um, we can go to the next one. So there are two types of permits that you can apply for. And right now you can do both of those permits on the One Stop app. Uh, so we're gonna do a matching, match existing colors, or you're gonna change the colors. Both are the exact same permit. It's a VCC paint permit application. And you can find that on the One Stop app. It's actually the only one that says VCC next to it. Um, if you're filling out, filling out building permits or general work or anything like that, that's gonna go through um, the building department before it comes to us. So when you go to the One Stop app, it is literally the only one that will say VCC. Um, so you're gonna go in there, you're gonna create a login, um, and then it's gonna ask you uh, what you see here on this screen. Um, you know, walls, shutters, doors and windows, uh, trim, ironwork, other surfaces. Other surfaces can be things like decking or stairs. Um, different features, let's say you have gingerbread uh, featured on the front of your house, uh, you have a later home, uh, things like that. You can include those. You can go to the next one, Brooke. Um, so if you know the colors, this is really easy. You're just gonna put it in there. A lot of people that have owned in the French Quarter for a long time, they know exactly what color, they know the manufacturer, they haven't changed the colors in a really long time, they can just plug it all in there. If you don't know the colors and you're just doing a color match um, and you're gonna take that down to, you know, home paint or wherever you're going to get your paint, you're gonna take your paint chip, they're gonna color match and then they're gonna give you your paint can. And on the top of the paint can is gonna be a color match formula. And they're always gonna put like a little dot on the top as a swatch so you know what's in each can. When you apply for your paint permit, just take a picture of that attach it to the paint permit application. It'll come to us. We'll know that you're painting to match existing. Simple, simple, simple. I'm the one that writes all the paint permits. Uh, I usually get it just depending on what my queue looks like, anywhere from three days to five, just depending. Uh, but that is super easy, no big deal. Um, just a very simple permit that we can help you with. A paint permit also covers um, things like, you know, a little bit of woodwork, caulking, things that Joey was talking about, caulking, uh, cracks in stucco, things like that. It will be covered under your paint permit. So that'll be in there as well. The other type of paint permit is if you are deciding to change things. So this is where it gets a little more complicated and people start to get a little bit more freaked out. It's the exact same process on one stop. You're going to go in. Um, I believe it asks you if I'm correct, it asks you existing color and then it asks you proposed color in yes. the detail page. Um, so you would put the existing color. Um, and if you don't know the exact color, let's say you just put yellow or brown or what have you. And then you would put the proposed color. And for the proposed color, we would need the actual name of the color and the manufacturer. Um, if you or just sort of pulling this out of the dark, that's not really the way to go about this. Uh, the very first step to changing the color on your house or business would be the next slide, Brooke, would be um, going finding out the age of your structure. And you can find that either at uh, vucre.nola.gov or uh, at hnoc.org. Either one of these two websites, you can plug in your address very easily. And then it'll give you the age of your building. It'll also very handily give you the rating of your building, which is also pretty important if you ever want to make any changes to the exterior of your building. So once you find out the age, the next thing you're gonna do is go to our guidelines, which you'll see here on the next slide. Uh, you can see it's broken down um, into each time period. So you would sort of plug in your date and then figure out a very broad range of colors that you may be able to use. Obviously, as Michael was talking about earlier, you can see from 1820s to 1840s, very limited. 
again, going right back to what he's saying historically. Um, it was cheaper. There weren't as many things available. Uh, New Orleans wasn't quite yet this cosmopolitan city open to the world. Uh, not that many things were here. So you can see progressively as you go through, you get more colors, more variations. Um, we do not like to tell people, you know, it can only be this one color and that's it. I, there are so many shades, as Joey was saying earlier, of one color. We want people to have some choice. We don't want them to feel hemmed in at all. This is your home. You're going to be living there. Um, there's some compromise to be made between the two of us. And I, I think that that can be done. And we all want, we want homeowners to be happy. So on the next slide. So once you've done that, so, so far you have got the data you're building, you figured out what colors are available and now you're doing your color selection. I'm more than happy to help. Um, all you have to do is email me or email staff. They'll send it to me. I can give you ideas where to start. I do highly recommend sort of starting with the Benjamin Moore historic colors. If you have no idea what you're doing, it just sort of gives you a place to start and you can kind of go from there. Next um, Tuesday, we're gonna unveil a color collection that'll give you an even better place to start. Yes, next, next Thursday, Thursday, next Thursday. Next Thursday, we will <laughs> unveil the French Quarter collection for Benjamin Moore. Um, but it sort of gives you a place to start. If you think you want a purple house, well, you probably can't have a purple house in the French Quarter, but you might be able to have a light lavender house. Um, you know, if you think you want a greenhouse, you probably can't have a structures greenhouse, you know, you, but you can, there are variations on color as Michael, you know, explained earlier. Um, so in the next slide, you'll see, I always tell people don't, get stuck on any one color. Choose about four or five colors. And then what you need to do is go and get some little pots of color, and then you need to go and paint them on your actual house. Um, stucco, masonry, wood, every color will look different on every different material. The way the sun hits it, this building, for instance, here, uh, I actually picked those colors that were on the bottom and they were the one on the top. They looked completely different at different times of the day. They look completely different than the swatch. They look completely different than it looked in the little pot of color. Um, so we're totally fine with that. If you want to paint a bunch of swatches, go ahead. I would rather see you get it right. I don't want to see you paint your house or get halfway through and then realize that you hate the color. Um, that's, so we're, we're totally fine with that. Just communicate with us, that's all. <laughs> and then the next slide, again, you'll see here, it just looks different on different materials. And by different materials, I mean, even your shutters too. If you're thinking that you're gonna use, you know, the color down the street that you saw on someone else's shutters and you need to try it. It might not look the same. It just might not. Uh, trim color, all of it. You should try every color that you're thinking. And then in the next slide, uh, once you've done that, and once I've seen it, we've talked about it, everyone's happy. I can fill out the permit very quickly and get it to you and then go about your business. Um, again, we do recommend just a little bit of time. Don't call and say you're changing all the colors and the guy's going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> Um, <laughs> some of this takes a little bit of time and a little bit of effort, um, but you know, it's all possible and we just want you guys to be happy with it as well. So just remember, we're all here to answer your questions and staff is always available. And I'm open for any questions. Anybody have questions for Renee? Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah. This actually got the address. This is what I was talking to you about yesterday. It was 941 St. Anne, the Purple mm -hmm. House of Porter. Um, I had talked with Brooke about it, how that house became those colors of purple. Was it because in the 80s, 90s, that it was colored that way and then kind of grandfathered in? Or how that permit went about? It's just what, I'm sorry, purple. Maddie, what was the address one more time? I'm sorry. Um, 941 St. Anne. 
it's just Sorry. I want to look it up because I don't I'm so curious about how that purple came to be it also could be um hold on one second I want to be able to look at it while I'm talking to you sorry Just give me one second, because I'm not sure. Uh, they, <laughs> this house has a lot. So because this house is later, okay. they have a lot more freedom in what they can do. Um, I will tell you our guidelines have changed. And I will also tell you that there were a few colorblind people <laughs> that worked at the BCC <laughs> that permitted some things that might not actually get through these days. But it's a you know, it's beautifully done and they maintain it and it it fits with that time period. It's just a little bit, it's an it's a newer home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's be it's great. Yeah. Sorry, I had to look that up. I apologize. I my French Quarter brand. <laughs> you know, and new in the French Quarter is still not new. For no, other no, places. no, it's not yeah. new. Yeah. yeah. When I say new, please know that I mean like early night, you know, late nineteenth, <laughs> early twentieth century. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. still one hundred and twenty years old. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you, Renee. <laughs> no problem, Maddie. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions about permitting? I see a, I see a hand. Is it? Oh, oh, a question I yeah, that's me. Um, what I was just one curious about trends. Do you see certain trends coming about now, or did you notice any trends at certain periods of time where 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 people just kept painting it white or green or? Do you mean do you mean the gingerbread trim or do you mean like give me a give me a style of well, I mean almost anything like that. Um, or do you mean seems like means like cast iron, it seems like they're all black or they're all Paris green with the cast iron or the wrought iron. And yes. then maybe certain trims, you know, it's see the the if it's a wooden house, it's white with green shutters or you know, that it just seems like and again, that's going to go back to that slide that we showed about the time periods, the aging. When you find out the date and then you go and look, certain dates, again, like Michael was talking about earlier, I'm not sure if you were on the call, um, but certain, certain time periods, more things were available. So certain paints were used more. Um, also, Creoles were notoriously pretty thrifty. Um, they used a lot of what they had lying around. Um, they weren't going to go out and buy the most expensive paint. So, you know, what Michael was kind of talking about earlier, uh, indigo, you're not going to paint your house indigo because that's the most expensive. So greens and whites, um, if you see up in the top left corner of this slide, um, those colors were just easier to come by and cheaper. Bottom line, cheaper. Yeah, and I guess cost probably even today is a prevailing factor. One hundred percent, and that's you know that's something I I wanted to say on what Joey was saying earlier. We love mineral paints, um, <laughs> but they're expensive, and the best use of mineral paints um, that I've seen have been when people have completely restuccoed their their buildings, and then they come back with a mineral paint, and it is fantastic. It's just, it's beautiful. It's, it's the way it's meant to be, it's finished. Um, but it, it is costly. Yeah, 100%. And then it looks like we have another question from Ann, Miss Ann Finney. Hi, good evening, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much for doing this. This is really great information. And, and just really, Renee, I would agree with you with the mineral paints. Um, yeah. But the life, the lifetime of it, um, you know, it's something to, to consider. One hundred percent. The cost, is, yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask, and I'm sorry if I missed this. Um, when you said VCC available on Thursdays on the slide, um, what I know people are still working from home, but um, what 
what does that mean exactly available on Thursdays? We're, so we are actually back in the office and we have been. Um, however, I don't, <laughs> it's going to sound terrible, but I just, there's no reason for anyone to have to come to City Hall. You shouldn't have to pay to park. You shouldn't have to drag yourself up to the seventh floor. Um, so I am available on Thursdays in the French Quarter. Um, I've Brooke has allowed me to use her office if I need a spot, but usually what I do is meet people on site. So if there's something you want to talk about and we can actually look at it together, um, for instance, tomorrow I have like four site visits <laughs> all over the French Quarter, but it's worked out really well um, to be able to use the foundation office as sort of a home base and then be able to be accessible um, to the public. And then obviously any other day of the week, we can always make an appointment. Um, I just, it, it's easier for people to sometimes just be at home and I stop by their house and, you know. Yeah, that's understandable. Yeah. Um, and then really quick, the, the Vucare Virtual Library, is that the VCC's library? And, and do y'all, I mean, the foundation did that for us so they took um they, Brooke if you want to explain it a little bit sure better. yeah I actually made the virtual library and then I'm now as the executive director expanding it um it's it's funded by the foundation but it's an online archive a growing online archive of the VCC's files so as we raise money it allows us to go scan more items and bring those to the public but those That's are fantastic. okay. Thank you. Those are free I, online. They're public property. They'll never have a paywall. For anything um, that hasn't been digitized yet, is it possible for the public to come in and do any kind of research or or make a request? It is one hundred percent. We usually you can you can email us, uh, make a request, give us an address, you know, whatever. Um, sometimes people think that we have things that we don't have. <laughs> um, yeah. We, because we're a regulatory agency, um, a lot of what we have is kind of boring permits. Um, and a lot of the paper stuff that we have only goes back maybe, in some cases it goes back to the 80s, but in most cases I would say 80s, 90s, some cases the 60s. Um, but the, uh, the most important thing that we had in there was the photographs, which Brooke digitized, but the the paper stuff, you're more than welcome to email us and say, hey, this is the address I'm looking for. I would advise specifying what you're looking for and we can look for it before you come down there. <laughs> okay, okay, that just, sounds great. Yeah, sometimes people think that we control more than we do. And they, they think that we have things that we don't have. Okay, fair and enough. And they're disappointed. Right, thank yeah. <laughs> thank you very well, much thank you for all of this. No problem. no problem. And like Michael mentioned, there is just an, an, an incredible wealth of knowledge at the Notorial Archives, yes. which are also open to the public um, right across Poitras from City Hall. So um, that's, is Chelsea Richardson still in charge of that? It's, the, it's under the office of the civil clerk and it's open to the public and the information there, you will have to have the staff help guide you through it, but it is Fantastic. Sorry, Miss Bruno, I see you. Um, you're up. <laughs> are mineral paints? What are mineral paints? And is it okay to paint your stucco if it hasn't been painted? Uh, in the French Quarter, no. <laughs> in, the, in the French Quarter, in the French Quarter, you are not allowed to paint anything that has not been painted. Uh, without it going to the architecture committee. And the only way the architecture committee would allow it is if we have historic evidence that it had been painted. So let's say um, you have a brick wall that you wanna paint. Uh, we can't allow that as staff. It would have to go to the architecture committee. And then the architecture committee would have to determine, we'd have to, there'd have to be some sort of evidence that it had been painted for them to allow it. Does that make sense? Sorry. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, there's a lot of feedback when you're not muted, so. I was just saying that um, it seemed like the example we use about paint samples is that unpainted stucco. 
That was brand new stucco. They had restucco the whole building. I see. I see. They had pulled <laughs> off. They had pulled off the old failing stucco and restuccoed the entire building. Wow. And re and repointed the brick as well. What is a mineral paint? I don't know what that is. Is that Joey question? Oh, Joey? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So it's a, it's it's like it says it's it's actually a little stone it's pota potassium silicate so it looks it would be a, a sand ground down from and it would be in different pigments to create those colors and put together with a with a binder so that it, it allows it to uh, to be to be rolled or brushed out onto a a, a masonry surface but the biggest uh, benefit from a mineral paint is the permeability or vapor transfer like we were talking about much higher than any other product that we uh, would, would be able to, to sell on that type of application. And it lasts for a very long time. The, uh, the caveat is it's more expensive. It's uh, about two to three times more expensive, uh, but does, does last for a very long time. Excellent uh, color uh, retention, and uh, it's only available in flats. So it's designed for stucco and masonry surfaces. So, Ms. Bruno, to answer your question, that, that one building that I showed you the example of, that they redid all the stucco, we suggested a mineral paint or a lime wash or something more natural, but it's a huge building. <laughs> Just, it's not cost effective. Did that answer? Perfect. Does anybody else have questions? I love this discussion. I don't see any more raised hands. Well, then I am going to give me a couple of days. I'm a one woman show, but I am going to put this up on our YouTube channel so that everybody can reference it at will. I will, <clears throat> I will share uh, Michael's PDF and the color chart and make sure I get all the information to appropriately credit not only Michael and Cypress Conservation, but also the Tulane program. I love when the stuff that I do gets my name put on it appropriately. And if you have questions about any of this, please send us emails. And thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a good night and stay safe. We managed to keep our power on. Woo! Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank